All right, folks, we're going to go ahead and, uh, and get started. Um, tonight we're here for our third and final on-campus Call 300 visit for the fall semester. As I've said in our other evening presentations, one of the goals of the Call 300 experiences is to lift us out of our familiar surroundings and to engage with people, places, and ideas that might be unfamiliar to us. Similar to experiences we might have when traveling abroad or even domestically to areas with which we are unfamiliar, those kinds of engagements can be uncomfortable. Indeed, one of the primary goals of our on-campus Call 300 course is to produce the kind of productive disorientation that allows us to see our own life experiences in a broader perspective. If you find yourself uncomfortable, I hope you will see that discomfort as an opportunity for growth. Just as we often experience discomfort as we stretch and exercise our bodies to meet new physical challenges, considering ideas that are new, foreign, or even challenging to our own lived experiences present opportunities for understanding the world as others may see it and live in it. We hope that in your classes you'll further explore and discuss the topics our visitors address. We are delighted to have as our final visitor this semester, Misha Cardenas, who joins us from the University of California, Santa Cruz, where she is Assistant Professor of Art and Design, Games and Playable Media. Momentarily, I'm gonna turn things over to Jenny Puzzi, who is an Associate Professor of English and Gender, Sexuality and Women's Studies, to give Misha a formal introduction. But before I do, I want to thank Ben Boone, our Associate Director, Sharon Morris, our Administrative Assistant, and all the uh, CLA faculty fellows for their work all semester long on making uh, our Call 300 visits such a success. I also want to thank our co-sponsors, Dean Conley and the Arts and Sciences Dean's Office, the Equality Lab, the 100 Years of Women's Celebration Committee, the Program in Engineering, Physics, and Applied Design, and all of the Call 300 instructors for their commitment to the Call curriculum and to the on-campus Call 300 program. Thanks very much, Jenny. Hello, everyone. Welcome back from fall break. I hope you're all relaxed. Um, thanks for coming tonight. On behalf of the Gender, Sexuality, and Women's Studies program here at William & Mary, it is my honor to welcome Misha Cardenas to campus and to this event tonight. I can't think of a person more appropriate for our Call 300 theme, Bodies That Matter. Cardenas's work brings together poetry, technology, community-based activism, and critical theory to respond to the ways that certain bodies get dismissed, devalued, and disappeared by the cultures in which they live. Whether she's thinking about immigrants crossing national borders, transgender women working out at the gym, or protesters facing police violence, Cardenas approaches social problems with creativity and a keen sense of social justice. She's an amazing activist, artist, and scholar whose work is always timely but is never easy. She demands interaction, engagement, and response from her audience no matter how difficult that commitment might be. Misha received her MFA at the University of California, San Diego, and her PhD in Media Arts and Practice from the University of Southern California. As a graduate student, she applied her knowledge of computer programming and platform design to her work as a hacktivist artist, working with technologies like virtual reality, entertainment systems, and mobile phones. Given that many of today's technologies that promise to liberate us were initially developed by the military or by racially segregated elites, she urges us to think critically about embracing technophilia. Throughout her theoretical work, she has grappled with the difficult question raised by Audre Lorde about whether or not the master's tools can ever dismantle the master's house. And if you don't know who Audre Lorde is, look that up. Misha is currently assistant professor of art and design, games and playable media at the University of California, Santa Cruz. She's co-authored two books and many articles, most recently in Transgender Studies Quarterly and GLQ, and is currently working on a book titled Poetic Operations, Trans of Color Media Oh wait, trans of color movement in digital media. Misha's solo and collaborative artworks have been presented in museums and galleries in the United States, Canada, Mexico, and Germany. In 2014, she was the recipient of the inaugural James Tiptree Jr. Fellowship, which recognizes artists who, quote, use speculative narrative to expand or explore our understanding of gender, especially in its intersections with race, nationality, class, disability, sexuality, age, and other categories of identification and structures of power. This so precisely describes Misha's work that I can't imagine why they don't just give her the award every year. 
Past projects and performances include Becoming Dragon, a 365-hour mixed reality performance in Second Life, and the Transborder Immigrant Tool, a device designed to help immigrants crossing the U.S.-Mexican border find water. While Cardenas's work often produces something practically useful, bulletproof clothing, for example, or electronic garments that allow marginalized people to stay connected, it also generates difficult but necessary conversations. For example, her interactive computer game Redshift and Portal Metal leads users on a science fiction space journey where they encounter the after effects of climate change, mass migration, and colonization. The project titled Hashtag Stronger has many moving parts, just one of which is an app that would potentially promote and facilitate fitness for communities that don't adhere to gender binaries. The project also pushes the discussion about transgender health beyond the very necessary focus on safety arguing that transgender people have a right to a more expansive sense of fitness that incorporates physical, mental, and spiritual health. In this cultural and political moment, we can all benefit from thinking in a more interdisciplinary, intersectional, and collaborative way. Misha's work models that sort of engagement for us and challenges us to refocus our lens and reframe our questions, always keeping our own privilege in mind. Please join me in welcoming Misha Cardenas to William & Mary. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Oh, the mic is on. Hello. Thank you all so much for coming. How are you doing? Good, OK. Um, let's restart the timer. OK. Um, it's such an honor to be here. I'm really grateful to Liz and Sharon and Ben and Jenny and everyone, the professors that are gonna have me in their class and everybody who worked on my visit, um, I'm, I'm really grateful. It's a really wonderful experience and um, I had already such a great exchange today with Jenny's class and students were really attentive and detail-oriented and um, yeah, I'm very happy with the visit, thank you. Um, so, uh, let's see. I was asked to talk about my story or my life, <laughs> uh, which is funny for an academic, because often we write about things which are not our lives. Um, but I often do actually write about or make artwork about my life, so it's a little bit more okay for me. Um, but uh, I think often there's this demand put on trans people to be like, tell us your story. I think often non-transgender people or cisgender people um, even when they're well-meaning, want to be like, oh, we want to know the like, truth of the trans woman's story and all of your suffering, tell us about it. And sometimes that's really voyeuristic, and sometimes that can be really violent. Um, so my work has really tried in different ways to actually resist that demand um, and to share some of my story while keeping some of my own story to myself. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about myself and a lot about my work. Um, over the next 20 or 30 minutes. So, um, I can't see all of the slide on my computer, but I want to start by acknowledging the original people of the land, the Pamunkey, uh, Chickahominy, and Mataponi Indian tribes. Um, how many people already knew those names? Uh, okay, great. Some people did not. Um, so, this context of colonization uh, is really important to my work. Um, it's obviously very present here with the colonial style buildings um, and the uh, you know, original sites of colonization being close by, uh, North American colonization. And so for me, decolonization actually is a guiding framework for everything else that I do, or a kind of overarching framework. Um, because Number one, because I think it is my ethical responsibility as a settler living on this land to do something, to respond to, make up for the fact that um, millions, over 10 million indigenous people were murdered in the settling of this country for us to be here, for us to have this place called what it is called now, Williamsburg. Um, in this particular region in Eastern Virginia, there used to be 30,000 um, people in the Powhatan uh, Paramount Sea. Um, now the numbers are around 3,000, or I think even less than 3,000, but that's what I read today, some estimates of 3,000. Um, so 
that's something that I try to think about a lot, is um, what is my ethical responsibility? And how could we possibly undo colonization? We live in this place, the language we speak, all the ideas that we have are a product of colonization and a product of Western thinking. So one of the main struggles of indigenous people is to keep their languages alive. So like the Pamunkey tribe, their language is almost entirely <coughs> forgotten and disappeared. So how could we ever make up for that? Imagine if your whole language was not only gone like you don't speak your language anymore, your language was forgotten. There's no more record of it. It's, it's history, literally gone. Um, those are some of the issues and some of the things that I try to think about in this work. Um, so how did I get here? OK, I'm going to start with this project, pretty, pretty early project, um, and start even before that. So um, uh, I was born in Miami, Florida. Um, and uh, it's too hot, so I moved away. <laughs> um, and uh, my experience was it was really conservative, too. Um, but so I, 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 I wasn't, I didn't feel really comfortable there. Um, so I grew up in Miami, Florida. My parents got divorced when I was seven. My mom, her whole plan in life was to be a housewife. She grew up in the 50s. So when my dad divorced her for his new wife, uh, she was devastated and literally couldn't keep a job. So from like seven years old on, I grew up really poor, like really poor. Like there were months at a time where we didn't have electricity or we didn't have water or you know food stamps, like eating peanut butter sandwiches from the food stamps. Um, and I think that experience early on led me to be like WTF. Um, what is wrong here? Why is it that my neighbors have like ATVs and Nintendos and I don't have electricity? Um, and fortunately for me, growing up in Miami, a nice Cuban economics professor gave me a book by Marx and um, <laughs> helped me understand early what is going on actually is capitalism. <laughs> um, or what I would say nowadays is uh, cis heteropatriarchal capitalism. Um, and of course, that's a, a part of colonization, a product of colonization that gives us this whole system that we're living in, right? Where it's perfectly normal. That some people are just going to be starving on the street, and we're just going to walk past them because of capitalism. Everything's individualized. I made my money. You didn't. Poor you. Um, and so I was interested in this uh, some sense of social justice, and also I think interested really in philosophy from an early age. I think I was like, I mean, okay, early on I was definitely reading to escape, because I was like, man, living in this house with no electricity sucks. But I could read these cool choose your own adventure books, <laughs> um, or these cool like mythology stories about Zeus and like all of these fantastical tales and. I used to go to the library every day uh, after school to the point that my mom was pissed. She's like, where have you been for so many hours? And I'm like, I was at the library <laughs> um, with another book. So um, yeah, I was pretty obsessed early with reading and social justice. And I feel like I started, I think I started reading like Nietzsche at 13. So definitely like a little kid reading some philosophy, being like, what's wrong with man? Why am I in this state? Um, <laughs> which I'm really grateful now and like continue to lead into where I'm at. Um, so I did my undergrad in computer science. Uh, it took me a long time, six years to do my undergrad degree. I was working full time the whole time and um, changed my major a bunch of times. I was interested in everything. I was like, astronomy? Cool, I want to do that. English? Oh yeah, I'm going to change my major to English. Um, and, but then I saw the movie Hackers and decided that that's what I should do with my life as be Angelina Jolie in Hackers. Uh, and that certainly the way to take down the government would be to be a hacker. Because like you can argue with people all day, but if you were a hacker, you could actually take down the government. That was my like 20-year-old thought. Little did I know that I was correct. And that our <laughs> whole country would be hacked by the Russians. I had no idea, but I was so right on, right from the beginning. <laughs> uh, also, my dad really wanted, I was like, I want to be a filmmaker. 
My dad was like, we didn't come here from Columbia for you to be a broke-ass filmmaker. You need to study science. Um, and fortunately, hacking and Angelina Jolie, I was like, okay, science, fine. So I did computer science, and then I worked as a software engineer for like uh, five years, and it was really boring. I was like, oh my god, I can't wait for the staff meeting so I can talk to a human instead of talking to this box. Um, and then I applied to grad school uh, at UC San Diego in computational neurobiology, and I did not get in. <laughs> uh, and that was the only school I applied to that year, so I waited a year, and in that year I met Ricardo Dominguez, who was an artist in the Electronic Disturbance Theater, and he was teaching at UC San Diego. And um, I met him, I interviewed him for my pirate radio show called Radio Antifascista. <laughs> really, that's what it was called, it was so cheesy. Um, and I interviewed him and I was like, whoa, this guy has figured out how to do art and technology and activism and travel and get paid for it. I just wanna do exactly what this guy does. So um, I applied to UC San Diego, to the MFA program, and by their kindness, I got in um, and when I was there at UCSD, uh, what year did I start? 2006 or five? 2006, 2006 I started. Um, so in the middle of that, Ricardo came to me and um, he was like, hey, uh, he was my advisor, so we were talking all the time. <laughs> but one of our conversations, he was like, hey, I'm working on this new project. Because um, he had done a lot of online activism and a lot of like solidarity with the uh, Zapatistas in Mexico. And um, he had a collaborator, Brett Stahlbaum, who was working on a virtual hiker algorithm that would look at maps and dynamically generate new hikes for you that were safe, I guess. Um, and he was like, me and Brett are working on a new project to make a cell phone app that would uh, let you find water in the desert, specifically in the desert of the US-Mexico border. Because we were living uh, 15 minutes from the US-Mexico border, and we were thinking about a really like direct action art or direct action activism translated into art. So in direct action uh, protests, instead of holding up signs and being like, please stop the war, please stop the war. When people engage in direct action, they're like, no, if you wanna stop the war, you should just lay down in front of the gates of the military base and then you might slow down some people getting murdered today. So what could you actually do with you and your five friends to address this problem? If you're like, please, please feed the homeless, hold up a sign, wait five years for legislation for there to be more money for homeless people. No, why don't you just make some soup and go feed some homeless people? So we had that strategy with our artwork. What could me, uh, me and my five friends do about the fact that the number one cause of death on the US-Mexico border is dehydration? People literally dying in the desert because they don't have water. And it seemed to us in the spirit of civil disobedience that there are moral laws that are above the legal laws it seemed to us that if somebody's dying of dehydration, you should give them water. You should not ask for their papers. So what we did was made this cell phone app uh, for cheap Nextel phones. Um, we figured you could get these phones for like 20 bucks on eBay and they had a GPS in them. And um, so we made this app uh, and we made a functional beta and we worked with, well, so Ricardo came to me and was like, hey, uh, we wanna work with these local activist organizations that are putting water in the desert for migrants. And um, a lot of them are actually like Catholic and religious groups that were putting out water in the desert because they didn't think that people should die. And I was doing a lot of activism against the Minutemen and um, who were this like white supremacist, anti-immigrant group in, on the border. And um, anyway, so he asked me to be the like liaison between the artist and the activist. And I was like, great, yeah, I will be happy to do that. So um, I worked with him on this project, or with them on this project, there were five of us, Ricardo, Brett, Amy, Sarah, Carroll, wrote the poetry, and uh, Ellie Merman did some of the audio, um, audio poems and a song, and I also wrote some poems for that project. But this project um, led me to thinking about, this project doesn't totally segue to the next one, but eh, okay. Um, so working with this group, the Electronic Disturbance Theater, and thinking about online protest, and thinking about like virtual embodiment, or we could even think about this old school app as a kind of augmented reality, where there's like a layer of data that is like overlaid on the real world. Um, so I was thinking about those things, and I decided for my MFA thesis to do this project called Becoming Dragon. And um, hmm, can you turn the sound like 
off, Ben? Thanks. Okay, let's start this at the beginning. Okay. I usually don't put video in my slides, so I'm trying something new. And, ah, resolution is different. Okay. And there's no way to play. Okay, great. Um, so, Becoming Dragon um, was a performance art piece that I did in Second Life. So it's in this online 3D virtual world. Um, and I wanted to question the one year requirement that trans people have of living as your chosen gender for a year before you can get surgery. Because I was, at the time, starting my transition and deciding whether or not I wanted to take hormones and facing doctors that were asking me, like, well, do you want surgery? Because you know, once you start taking hormones, you better know what you want. And I wasn't really sure. Um, but I knew what I wanted, which was to be a woman. Um, but more than that, I wanted to think about political embodiment online that could be more than just a web page. So using this virtual world seemed to make sense to me in that way, to bring in the body to online political embodiment. And so it's kind of a science fiction or speculative design project that was asking, um, like, could you live f for a year in a uh, second life and then get species change surgery? Um, partly because I wanted to also be questioning the binary between male and female. And so I picked a dra an avatar that was non-binary. Well, I think that dragons are not male or female. Apparently, in my 10 years of discussions to people about this, some people are convinced that dragons are female or <laughs> dragons are male. Who thinks, who thinks dragons are male? Who thinks dragons are female? One person, three people, four. Okay, who thinks dragons are female? Okay, cool. I, I mean, I, I, I'm not, I don't disagree with you. Okay, so um, five people. I thought that maybe a dragon would be like a non-binary kind of identification. And also dragons, in, in a lot of mythology, dragons are shapeshifters, so I related to that. Um, also, I was obsessed with Dungeons and Dragons um, <laughs> from a very young age. I very much credit uh, my original NES and Dungeons and Dragons with me being a game designer now. So if you want to be a game designer, I think you should start playing Dungeons and Dragons. Um, but make, make sure you're playing with a diverse group of people, because it can be really awful, but uh, you can be done really well. So anyway, Dungeons and Dragons, um, Becoming Dragon. So I lived in Second Life for a little over 15 days with a head-mounted display, virtual reality goggles, so that all I could see was Second Life. And I was really interested in developing a new kind of artwork like, called mixed reality performance. Because at UCSD, what they taught us at the UCSD art department was, it's not your job to make a better sculpture. It's your job to invent a new medium like sculpture. So I was trying to do that. I was trying to think about mixed reality performance art as a whole new medium. Um, so I used a whole bunch of different ways of blending multiple realities, like motion capture system and uh, 3D printing. And um, I used the video feed of the real world to feed into the virtual world. Um, OK, I talked for too long about that. OK, so after Becoming Dragon, um, I wrote, uh, I co-authored a book with a number of people about my thoughts about that experience called The Trans Real. And, um, the main idea that I argued in that book is that the experience that I had in Becoming Dragon is actually very common to many people today. That our identities are not just in one reality. So, um, for example, you have your identity right here, like your physical identity, what you're wearing, your makeup, how your hair is, your glasses, whatever, whatnot, right? That's one particular identity that you have, but does anybody in here use Facebook or social media or Snapchat or Twitter? Probably most people. OK, great. So then at the same time, right now, simultaneously, that you have this physical identity, you have another identity, which is your identity on Facebook. And that might be your identity from all the best angles. That might be your identity throwing up after partying on Saturday. I don't know what it is you put on social media. But um, my advice is don't put anything on social media you don't want to talk to the cops about directly. Honest to God, that is my advice, because you know there's so much surveillance, whatever. I won't get into that project. Um, uh, what was I even saying? Oh yeah, trans real identity. So I think that identities today actually span multiple realities. 
many different realities. So in Second Life, you know, I had that identity that was like my avatar. Uh, supposedly our Facebook identities are our real names and real identities, but that's not true for everybody. Some people, their legal name, uh, Facebook doesn't accept. Or some people, um, I mean, this, I think there's lots of ways to see discrepancies between our social media identities and our real identities. So my idea with TransReal was an identity that's spanning multiple realities, but beyond that, actually an art practice and ways of thinking that span multiple realities. And I think this continues to be really relevant to me to, for me today. Now that we're living in this world of alternative facts, um, I, it seems that we are living in multiple realities. Literally, the person sitting right next to us might be in a totally different reality. And my experience arguing face-to-face -face every Saturday for many years with neo-Nazis when I was doing activism is that if somebody wants me to die, I actually, it's not my job to convince them. And I'm never gonna convince them that what I have to say is worthwhile. So I decided, after facing off with neo-Nazis on the border, that, that those people are not my audience. And nowadays, I think that actually, there are multiple realities. So in many ways, there is, it's up to us to can figure out how to move forward as a species with many different realities existing in the same room or in the same space. And how can we hold complexity and hold difference? Um, which is not to say that I think science is not real or facts are not real, because I do think they are real. I just think that uh, different people have different ideas of what's real. And you can't, you can't necessarily change those ideas. OK. Um, so uh, this year, actually, I was invited at the Vector Festival to do a little 10-year anniversary performance of Becoming Dragon. Fortunately, the technology is better. The avatars are better. The, the fire breath effects are way cooler. So um, I redid Becoming Dragon. And in this performance, I'm reading poetry um, about my experience of transition. Uh, for the audience, and um, so I did that again for this new media festival in Toronto. Okay, so um, after I did that MFA, um, I, uh, <laughs> I thought I would be able to get a job teaching. And uh, the only teaching jobs that I found, university professor jobs that I found, were in very rural places that I didn't want to live. I graduated in 2009, just after the 2008 economic crash. Um, so after two years of working random jobs and looking for a job, I decided maybe I could uh, get somebody to pay me to do a PhD instead of getting a job. And that happened. That was true. <laughs> uh, so I also found a good school that had a professor that I wanted to work with um, at University of Southern California. Um, but I applied there, and they offered me twice as much money as UCLA did. I'm just being real with y'all because you're, we're undergrads. You asked me to talk about my life, and um, you know I never made much money. So these things were important to me that USC literally had twice the amount of stipend for PhDs. Um, but also you should know, if you're thinking about going to grad school, that if you find the right program, you can get paid to do your graduate work. So I encourage you to do that. Um, and so a lot of uh, my time in my PhD, I worked on this project called Local Autonomy Networks. So um, I don't know if I should have said trigger warning at the beginning of this talk, but I do talk about violence a lot in my work. So I'm going to talk about some right now. So um, uh, let's see. This was, I started my PhD in 2011. So. Um, uh, yeah, I learned in 2010 that uh, I was a survivor of childhood sexual abuse. And that really changed my opinion about what I wanted to do with art. At the time, I had been doing a lot of like really experimental stuff and um, very things that I thought were risky. A lot of performance art is valued on how much risk you're taking on stage. And so after I learned that, then I decided that actually what I wanted to focus my artwork on was safety and care for myself and my communities. And so I started working on this project called Local Autonomy Networks, which was thinking about how to prevent assault and violence against trans women of color and just people of color, women more broadly, and how to prevent assault. Um, so I made this line of clothes and accessories that were mesh networked. So uh, I made these uh, hoodies and dresses and bracelets that had wireless transmitters in them um, to think about how we could build safety with our communities without relying on police and prisons. 
Because for many people, like queer and trans people and people of color, if something terrible happens to you, you don't want to call the police because it will just mean that another terrible thing is going to happen. There are many instances of sexual assault in which the police are called and then the police show up and assault the person. So I was thinking, OK, what can me and my five friends do to try to prevent each other from being killed? Maybe we could create a safety network and create some agreements amongst ourselves about what to do when I press the button. So when I press this button on my hoodie, like the lights would come on and the lights would come on on yours, and then it would also vary depending on proximity. Um, so I was thinking about how to build uh, kind of technological safety networks, but also um, I started showing those to people in workshops. Oh, I think the video's here. Newfangled technology. Yes, great, okay. I started showing those to people in workshops like queer and trans people and, um, and uh, working with community organizations like Gender Justice LA and doing this in different countries like in Brazil and Germany and Canada. And so immediately a lot of the feedback I got was, uh, this is a cool idea, but it's too expensive. If I had $100, I would buy a smartphone. I don't, so I don't. So I can't buy your $100 of wearable electronic hoodie. So I realized early on that when I needed to shift the workshop content to be like, how could we actually build safety strategies to think about these technologies as like a prototype? And so we developed uh, performance art pieces out of those workshops, where in the performance we were talking about like, what could be some actual safety strategies we could use in our actual daily lives? Like, I, I think that's the, probably the best outcome of this project. I encourage people to have those real conversations with the people close to them about how to create a safety network. Like, the buddy system is now, I think, is pretty much the best safety technology. Um, so I encourage you to have a buddy when you're walking home from a party in the dark. But also, uh, things we talked about in that workshop were things like nonverbal communication strategies. Like, if I'm in public and I need to leave, and I need the person sitting next to me not to know that I need to leave, what signal can we have so that we can get the heck out of here? Um, or how can we disperse in public and come together in public? So we practice these things in these workshops and develop performance art pieces out of them. Um, they're pretty expressive. I mean, we use theater of the oppressed. I asked people to come up with gestures that represented either safety or protection. Uh, and then we all flocked in a group together and kind of mirrored each other's gestures. Um, and some of the people in the video, in those performances were uh, dancers, some were not. Okay, 26 minutes. I'm going very rapidly through the rest of this. So um, thinking about auto nets uh, or local autonomy networks, I've been working on a book forthcoming from Duke University Press. It's a big project I've been working on for like six years. and. Um, what I'm thinking about is, uh, th so like starting with this project of sewing wearable electronics that have code in them, right? And um, I looked at other philosophers, because I'm still really interested in philosophy and responding to philosophy. So artists, philosophers like Deleuze have proposed operations for thinking about the world or for acting in the world like the cut. And so I wanted to think about other operations that we could use in a trans of color poetics. So if we're thinking about what are the poetics of trans of color art and digital media, what might some of the operations be? Um, and so overall the project there is to propose an idea of algorithmic analysis. So let me put, tie those two things together. So I'm um, really it, profoundly inspired by intersectionality and Kimberly Crenshaw. And so in, Intersectionality, Kimberly Crenshaw offers a model for thinking that is actually based on like a geometric visualization of two lines, right? She actually refers to streets intersecting. So it's been like an incredibly important transformative model for thinking that like has transformed so many people's thinking and lives. So what I'm thinking is like what other tools for thinking do we have now? And one main tool I think we have is the algorithm. And algorithms are causing people a lot of harm today, but I think that we could use them instead for uh, safety and protection. And so one method of algorithmic analysis is, so an algorithm is basically like a recipe. It's not, I mean, they, yes, they're complicated in code and whatnot, but even if you don't know how to code, you can think of the recipe for whatever, chicken. There's some ingredients for chicken, and then there's some steps, right? Like put the oil in the pan, put the pan in the oven, there's a list of steps. So an algorithm is basically like that. 
Um, so what I, what I argue is that two of the steps that I have seen used in artwork by myself and other people are shifting and stitching, like shape shifting and stitching of actual garments or stitching actually people together using uh, building kind of solidarity and relationships. Um, so with the last minute, I just want to mention um, things that I've been working on recently uh, in addition to that book or post that book are this bullet, DIY bulletproof clothing project that um, Jenny mentioned that's called Unstoppable. I'm happy to come back and talk about these things in the Q&A, um, but I, uh, it's a collaboration with Patrice Colors of Black Lives Matter where I found that you can use very inexpensive materials to create your own bulletproof objects like backpacks and clothes, namely Kevlar and tires are things that you can recover from junkyards. And then I went out in the desert with some friends who know about guns and tested those materials and found that, yes, you can actually stop a nine millimeter bullet with, uh, by spending zero dollars. Um, also, uh, in some of the other more recent writing that I've done, I uh, wrote this Android Goddess Declaration after manifestos in Liz's new book, uh, a book edited by Liz Losh <laughs> and Jackie Wernemont, uh, Bodies of Information. And so this is continuing that thinking about algorithmic analysis and looking at popular media like Westworld and asking what we can learn from androids. And I think one main thing that we can learn from androids, especially if we watch a show like Westworld, is that the way we treat non-human things shapes who we are. So the way we treat our AI, or the way we treat our animals, or our environment, or our plants, or even objects around us, really shapes who we are as a people. Um, so the last thing that I want to mention is um, the game that I'm working on now. So it's a prequel to this earlier game I did called Redshift and Portal Metal, um, which I'm happy to talk about in the Q&A. But the prequel is called Seen Soul. Because um, with a lot of my previous work, I was really concerned with safety and security for myself and my communities. And I feel lately now like actually what I'm committed to is safety for all beings everywhere. And it is more and more evident to me that climate change is um, rapidly killing us. And I was in Seattle last summer where the wildfires in BC came and they were, the wildfires in British Columbia, Canada were so intense that um, they literally filled the sky with smoke and just one day you woke up and you could not see the sun anymore or the moon or the stars or anything. So I've been working on a game about that where the main character is this trans-Latina AI hologram. And I'm collaborating with these other brilliant artists, Abraham Avnison, Morgan Thomas is the character designer who did these amazing sketches of the character. Um, and Marcelo and Adrian are the 3D modelers and Wynne Greenwood is the sound artist. And these are some of Morgan's amazing sketches. This is the one that we decided to go with. This is gonna be the environment for the game. So part of the game, the game takes place in the future and this AI hologram is telling you about how the world used to be before the environment collapsed. So something we're doing in that spirit is actually making 3D scans of the forest in the Pacific Northwest. So this is a 3D scan of the forest. And then in our installation that's opening at the Henry Museum, uh, next week, <laughs> we are combining all these elements into an augmented reality presentation where Aura is the character, will be there and you'll hear the poems and um, she looks something like this and I just got this model yesterday. Um, yeah, can I even do that down? No, that stops that. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that I will stop there. Thank you so much. Hear me in the back. Yeah. I can't really tell if I'm on. Is her I'm microphone on? Yeah. Oh, okay, I'll talk louder. I'm good. Okay. Um, so I. Have, oh, I think it's because you're facing away from the microphone. It's on the left, and you're facing to the right. I'm not used to wearing a microphone. <laughs> I am not a performance artist. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
So they're going to be asking you questions and um, writing down questions and sending them up here. But in the meantime, I will ask you a couple. Um, I was able to have Misha visit my transgender fictions class earlier today, so I got to ask her many of my questions, but I have many more. Um, so for me, when I first heard about the Bodies That Matter theme, the thing that jumped to my mind right away was what bodies don't matter, right? Um, what bodies don't matter culturally, right? Um, and I wondered if you could talk a little bit, um, I mean, I may have just sort of said what you're going to say, but like, if you could talk a little bit about what you think about that theme. Um, I mean, what did you think when we asked you to come here? Mm -hmm. Does that accurately describe your work to some degree, or mm -hmm. is there some way in which you would adjust that theme, you know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, thank you. Address the theme, something <laughs> I should have done. <laughs> oh, <so laughs> but, we I have do done. Yeah. but I can do it now. Um, yeah, I have lots of thoughts about that theme. I mean, one is that, of course, that's the title of a book by Judith Butler, mm -hmm. um, Bodies That Matter, which was um, her second book after Gender Trouble, or maybe her third book, but the book that came after Gender Trouble. And um, so Judith Butler is a <clears throat> gender theorist. How many people read Judith Butler? A few people? OK. Yeah. So um, yeah, Judith Butler, I think, did really important, rigorous, and brilliant work. Um, also, I think that she's very dismissive of trans people mm -hmm. and um, actually says that like Venus extravaganza was killed because she was like deluded into the fantasy of not being able to overcome that she was Latina. Um, and I find that very problematic. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a common stereotype or trope about trans women that we're just like deluded living in fantasy land. And people reproduce that trope in many different ways. And um, I don't think that that's true. <laughs> um, and I don't think that Venus Extravaganza made some miscalculation because she was in a fantasy land. I think she was making detailed calculations every day about her survival and you know, still ended up being killed, um, which is really sad. But it's, you know, it's very common for trans women. Um, so the other thing I think about this idea of bodies that matter and bodies that don't matter is um, a couple of things. Um, one is that a, a lot of what I write about in my book is uh, the idea of necropolitics from Akhil Mbembe, who's a South African theorist. And so um, Mbembe is responding to Foucault. So Foucault talked about how governments gain authority over us by promising life and safety and security. And um, Mbembe was a South African theorist writing in uh, 2009, maybe. I'm not sure the year of that essay. <laughs> yeah. um, and said, you know, it doesn't look from here like our government promises safety and life and security, actually. And he, he said in that instead, I think that governments today work by promising safety and life and security for some people and by guaranteeing death for other people. And I think that uh, his analysis is very true, and we see that in many different ways. Um, one of the ways that he talks about that in, uh, is through uh, invisible killings, or sort of killings that don't really matter. And um, we see that often in the case of transgender women. So um, there was an article in, I think, 2017 about the number of trans women that had been murdered that year, and the number of them that had actually been investigated by the police was only half. So only half of the trans women murdered that year even had any kind of investigation into them. So I think there's so many examples where we see uh, people dying that for some reason don't matter. And um, you know, don't matter to popular media and oftentimes don't matter even to other activists. Um, so a lot of my work has been to, number one, try to make those struggles visible, but number two, Again, try to ask, like, what could me and my five friends actually do to build our safety? Because it seems like nobody else is going to do it. Mm. Um, but I mean, obviously, the, that title could relate these days to the Black Lives Matter movement, mm -hmm. um, which you know has I feel like has changed so much, and um, it's one of, definitely one of the most important movements that we see today. Um, and the founders of that movement, like Patrice Cullors, who I mentioned. Um, they, um, they were really clear in their talking about the movement that they're talking about all black lives mattering. So they're talking about black trans women's lives mattering and black queer people mattering and black children mattering. Um, 
So, uh, you know, that really gives me a lot of hope. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. <laughs> so your, your comment um, about trans women of color and the sort of the way in which their violence against trans women of color is ignored also makes me think about that's way, that's the way in which that's paired with an increased visibility for certain trans people in the media. Mm -hmm. um, and so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about like the benefits of increased visibility, mm -hmm. but also the drawbacks of that kind of visibility, the, the particular type of visibility of trans people, mm -hmm. maybe particularly trans women. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, I mean, uh, in one sense, increased visit, and, and I think I heard Raina Gossett say this first, or Tourmaline say this first at the Insight Com Women of Color Against Violence conference in Chicago, that the increase in visibility for trans women has just meant more violence. Mm. Um, and uh, it's very true. So in 2014, uh, when Laverne Cox was on the cover of Time, uh, the number of murders dramatically increased. I think they increased by 50%. Um, and aside from the number of murders, the number of hate crimes against, okay, there's a lot of good critique of hate crimes legislation, but still, regardless, having those statistics is helpful. Yeah. And the number of hate crimes against trans women of color tripled in 2014. So in many ways, we can see how more visibility has meant more violence and more death. Um, but I suppose uh, that you know, maybe that the hope is that there's more <coughs> long-term change. I'm sorry, can you say that again? More long-term change yeah. that comes about from that kind of visibility, which, I mean, I yeah. see, like I said in your class today. Yeah. Um, um, you know, I started transitioning 10 years ago, and when I finished, by the time I, by the time I, I got to my qualifying exams of my PhD, so I had an undergrad degree and two masters and half a PhD, nobody ever assigned me to read any texts by another trans woman, ever. Literally, no one ever assigned me a book to read by a trans woman. It wasn't until I made my own reading lists that I was like, cool, I'm finally gonna read some trans women. <laughs> um, and now, today, I mean, your class is full of books about trans women, and a lot of them have only recently been published. Yeah. So, you know, that's optimistic yeah. Yeah. in terms of long-term change. But also, I think that it is part of necropolitics, um, this modulation of visibility. And, um, you know, uh, Mbembe talks about this, that, that necropolitics works through things like holograms, which are shifting. Like, you have to literally move your head to shift to see a hologram in a different way, right? Um, that, like, a simple idea of, like, we want visibility or we want invisibility <clears throat> is kind of obsolete because neoliberal capitalism, the system that we're living in, has already figured out how to profit off of every kind of diversity. You got a new kind of diversity? Great. Sell more t-shirts and more TV shows and more mm -hmm. books. Awesome. Um, so we need other strategies in our work. Mm -hmm. So that's why part of my work is trying to argue for shifting as a method of safety mm -hmm. and learning from other women of color feminists like Jella Sandoval, thinking about differential consciousness and like shifting even in our consciousness um, throughout the day. That like sometimes you might want to be super visible. Like when you're sitting on stage talking about transition to 700 undergrads at Marion Williams <laughs> College. <laughs> uh, or sometimes you want to be super invisible. Like, I don't know, when you're walking to a bus stop, right. you might change like which jacket you're wearing to look, to feel a little safer. Uh, do I still have time? Do I get one more? Okay. Um, so I love the way you cite the, scho the scholars whose work you rely on. You know, I think that's super important, especially with women of color and trans women, you know, scholars and artists that like, we're continually showing how we're engaged with their work and showing how their work is still relevant and things like that. And it makes me think about the larger importance of collaboration in your work. And I think so often in academia, whether we're undergrads or whether we're scholars or grad students or whatever, that we're always pushed to do the individual project, right? We want to make mm -hmm. our name for ourselves or, you know, and it, but it seems like so much of what you do is either collaboration with an audience or collaboration with other artists or other scholars. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, thank you. Um, I mean, I think partly 
I think partly that is my old like anti-capitalist anarchist uh, decolonial method there <laughs> of um, you know capitalism is very individualist. Mm -hmm. Like Hoover will be very happy for every single one of us in here to buy a vacuum cleaner mm -hmm. instead of sharing them. <laughs> um, and I mean the whole system of colonization, right? Is like I got my plot of land, you're over there, stay the f away. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, an earlier decolonial method is more about, like, things communally shared. Um, and I'm also just, like, lucky to have really benefited from generous collaborators like mm -hmm. Ricardo Dominguez. Um, like, I, co I collaborated with some other faculty members at, at UCSD, and you would never know that I worked on their projects because, mm -hmm. like, I was just, like, a worker. And mm -hmm. you might, maybe if you look through the website deep in the credits somewhere, but Ricardo was like, no, if we're collaborating, your name goes next to my name. Yeah. And it changed my life. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I was just a student. I'm so grateful for that. And people, you know, even the art world is incredibly individualistic. So we would get publications or exhibitions that would literally come out and just say Ricardo Dominguez. And he would be like, excuse me, I have four collaborators. These are their yeah. names. Please add them to the publication. Thank you. Um, and, you know, he was pretty diligent about that. So I've tried to do that in my work. Mm -hmm. um, like when I collaborate with students, uh, or like Francis Lee, I worked on some projects with, or um, like my collaborators now. And it is still consistently a challenge, you know, mm -hmm. so much of academia, like a tenure review, they want to know, like, what did you do? Just you by yourself. So it's very ingrained into our systems, which just shows how much our systems are still tied to capitalism. Questions? Can we take questions from the audience? Can, can we have students stand up when they ask questions? I, I feel like when I was sitting over there the last couple weeks, I couldn't see. <laughs> Sorry, is that awkward? <laughs> okay, um, so I was interested in, like, you mentioned the whole hacker influence on your decision to study computer science. And I guess I'm curious, like, as an undergrad deciding what to major in, like, how much was, like, practicality a part of your calculus and like how did you ration like rationalize that like art would art and activism like where did you see them fitting into your life when you decided to major in computer science and like in those like six years as you spent as a software engineer did you get to engage with art and activism at all or did you wait until like I guess Ricardo entered entered your life um good question thanks I um I, th I think I think there was a lot of practicality in my computer science decision. Um, I mean, I was trying to major in computer science and uh, I failed calculus. And um, I was like, oh, I'll try it again. I failed it again. <laughs> and um, I was like, cool, this is really hard. Maybe I should go back to poetry. So um, <laughs> I uh, tried again and I failed calculus five times. And then, um, then I had this girlfriend, <laughs> and um, she was a really, co really committed scholar. Her father was a heart surgeon, and she was going to be a neuroscientist, and there was no question about it. And like, I had pretty much no idea how to study. Like all through high school and the beginning of college, I was just like, whatever, I'm smart. I'll just read a few pages and just make something up. Ooh, and just coast by. So when I got to something difficult that required study, I had no idea how to do it. And um, that girlfriend, who will not be named, but thank you, uh, <laughs> absolutely taught me calculus. Um, and I think at the time, that helped me get into computer science. And also then, I, soon after that, got a job as like a software tester. And um, I was like, wow, I am like making money. We're going to get married and have babies. I'm going to keep doing this trajectory. This looks good. It's working really well. Um, we didn't get married or have any babies, sadly. Um, and I moved on. And then I was working as a software engineer. I literally moved on to California. Uh, and then I was working as a software engineer. And um, so I like this life story question. It's so indulgent. Because <laughs> I don't talk about it much. Um, so. Yeah, so I was in California. OK, so Miami was like really conservative. And I was like, oh, I want to be an activist. I'm reading Marx and stuff. And like nobody, there was nobody. I didn't know anybody. I didn't know any queers. I didn't know any activists. 
I tried to start like a Latin American solidarity group and I like put up two flyers and held a meeting and nobody showed up and I was like, I'm done. <laughs> um, and so then when I moved to California, uh, it was 2001, right after the 9-11. I had really great luck with graduating, looking for jobs and economic crashes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I graduated in 2001, uh, and I, I was in California, and uh, the war in Iraq was starting, and there were activists around me. And um, so I started getting involved in activism. And uh, over the next two years, I was like increasingly committed to activism and increasingly hating my job. And uh, as a software engineer, you're like sitting at your little terminal. So, you know, by the end, I was probably spending like 50% of my day doing on activism online <laughs> <laughs> and working at this startup where people were like working through New Year's Eve, like committed to the success of the stock. And then they had called, pulled me in for a meeting and they're like, we just think your heart's not in it. <laughs> and I was like, you're right. <laughs> you're so right. <laughs> oh man. So I lost my stock, but and their stock never went anywhere. So that's okay. And um, then I, yeah, then I was applying to grad school and then I met Ricardo, yeah. And then the war in Iraq started. Uh, go ahead. <laughs> Hello, um, Hi. I was curious how you deal with um, issues of accessibility that often come up when um, like both technology and art are concerned, both sort of financial barriers to entry and then also like ideological ones. Yeah, thanks. Um, accessibility is, uh, is something I think about a lot. Um, a lot of my work was about disability justice, so my essay, Sick, and my, um, my uh, pregnancy project also deals with disability. I mean, and Redshift and Portal Metal is kind of about uh, MCS, or multiple chemical sensitivity. Um, so it's a thing I try to keep alive in my work. Um, I mean, I have a lot of disabled friends and have had partners and I, people I care about a lot who are, have dis levels of disability, so it's the thing I try to think about in my work. I don't think I'm always successful. I think disability is like such a broad spectrum that, I mean, I've seen disability justice and accessibility done really well, mostly at spaces in Toronto where, um, you know, they have ASL for every event mm -hmm. because if you don't have ASL, how is somebody who's deaf supposed to come to your event? And then they have dedicated seating for the ASL. Uh, and they have sent free seating because some people are, have multiple chemical sensitivities, like me. Um, and then they have sent free seating ushers. Mm -hmm. I've actually seen accessibility gone to the point where they like let people know what kind of paint is used in the room ahead of time because some people are really sensitive to chemical smells. So I am like way below that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I mean, I try to think about accessibility at my events and, you know, events that I've gone to more than once, try to, like, encourage them to have ASL. Oftentimes I will ask, like, <coughs> galleries and museums about accessibility for the exhibitions. Um, but, I mean, there's also the question of ideological accessibility, I think you mentioned. And I think that that answer for me is two parts. One is that my work takes a lot of different forms and some of them are accessible to some people and some of them are not. Mm -hmm. So like with local autonomy networks, um, I did a lot of workshops in community-based organizations where like all you had to do was come in the door and sit down and participate. And there was no academic paywall or there was no, you know, didn't have to pay anything to get in or anything. Um, and I think that's working with one audience that's really important to me and, you know, communities that I really want feedback from on my work. Um, but sometimes I also publish academic articles because uh, that's my job. <laughs> and um, often those times those are not very accessible to many people. People that are not at universities often can't even afford to pay for transgender studies quarterly and would never read that article. Um, but I've also tried to publish in open access journals online. So the ADA journal, A-D-A, Journal of uh, Gender, New Media, and Technology, puts all of their articles online, totally accessible for free to everyone. So I did put my pregnancy video there so that it's accessible to people. One up top. Hi, so, um. so um, as a fellow gamer, <laughs> I have to ask, uh, what is your favorite video game and why? <laughs> Yeah, um, I think 
most video games are terribly boring and offensive. Um, <laughs> Most video games I really don't like. I mean, I play a lot of video games nowadays because it's my job, um, and uh, lucky me. <laughs> um, my favorite game is Dungeons and Dragons, period. So Dungeons and Dragons is better than any video game. Because like, if we were playing Dungeons and Dragons now, I could be like, and then I transform into a dragon that has like spitting glitter and it's like exploding into multiple spectrums of colors and ether, and then there's the astral plane coming out of it and into it and, you know, all of these amazing things could happen instantly. And if I had to make a video game about that, it would cost me like, you know, $100 million to hire all of these 3D modelers and blah, 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 blah. Um, so d and is the best game. <laughs> but um, and also as a scholar of video games, I don't really have one favorite game, you know? I mean, it's been different over time. So as a kid, I was obsessed with Metroid which is good evidence, because of course Metroid is kind of a trans game, so you should play it. Um, but um, yeah, when I got my any original, so I had a Commodore 64 and an Atari 2600, mm -hmm. but then when I got my original NES, my mom could not get me to eat. She was like, come and eat, and I was like, no, I have to win Metroid. Um, or original Zelda was amazing. Mm -hmm. Um, and then for a while, I was really into stupid shooter games. Like when Doom came out, when Quake first came out, I was like, oh my God, amazing. Um, so I spent many, many hours of my life playing Counter-Strike. I used to be that college kid that would stay up, be playing Counter-Strike, like online shooter games, shooting other people, until like the sun came up and I'd be like, fine, I guess I have to go to bed now. Um, and then I had a period of many years where I was like, I'm an activist, I'm, I'm so offended by those games, I won't play them anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and then I discovered Journey, which is this incredible game for PlayStation, uh, PlayStation 3, uh, and... What is it called? Journey, okay. J-O-U-R-N-E-Y. Uh -huh. Yeah, and it's a non-violent game, it's a cooperative game, it has a beautiful soundtrack that won an Emmy. Like, literally the point of the game is to take a beautiful journey through the desert and up the mountain, and um, when I saw Journey, well, my classmates at USC showed me Journey. When they showed me Journey, that's when I was like, oh, oh, games could be beautiful artwork. Oh, wow, I guess I care about games again. And that's why I started making Redshift and Portal Mill. And lucky me, uh, last year I saw a job opening at UC Santa Cruz mm -hmm. and uh, I applied and the chair of the department is Robin Hunnicke, who is one of the designers on Journey, and now she's my boss. <laughs> <laughs> and colleague and the studio neighbor, so lucky, that's cool. So I like Journey. I also like the new Zelda. Yeah. Because Link is so queer. Like, I what is Link's know. gender? No. Right? So my daughter, so, sorry, we have to do this for a minute. So my daughter is trans, my 12-year-old, and um, she will not leave Gerudo because you get to dress, Link is supposedly male, but you get to dress in this sort of warrior woman outfit with the veil, and, it, and she refuses to, like the game has all of these landscapes and all of these figures and everything, and she refuses to leave Gerudo. She spent like a year in Gerudo. Yes, <laughs> awesome, it's, yeah, it's, it's good. Great game. Um, there was a question way up at the top, and he got kind of left behind. Uh, yeah, I guess sort of building off that, and from when you mentioned Second Life, how important do you feel having sort of different media for people to sort of, I guess, escapism into to sort of fulfill how they see themselves or how they wish they could be? Sort of like the being a warrior, princess sort of thing <laughs> in Gerudo. Mm -hmm. And do you feel that sort of a just escapism, or that's sort of a natural human desire, I guess? Um, what I tried to think about in Becoming Dragon is uh, the, the nuance and the details in between those two positions. I don't think it's just escapism. Uh, and What's the other position of it being not just escapism? Um, I mean, I don't think it's necessarily good or bad. So I think that like part of what I was trying to think about in Becoming Dragon is like how these things actually have an effect on who we are. Not just because you have that identity that's here, you also have that identity on Facebook or on Twitter or whatever right now, 
But also, like um, at Harvard, there was a, a virtual reality study around 2008 that showed that after 30 seconds with an avatar in a virtual reality environment, most users change their real world behavior after 30 seconds. Mm. So if that's all it takes, then how many, what could be the effect of playing like Grand Theft Auto and killing and assaulting women for hundreds and hundreds of hours? It could probably be a really big effect. Um, or the effect of playing some other game where you get to be a woman and you had never had that experience before. It could have a huge, fantastic effect. Um, so that is partly what I'm interested in. Uh, that is more what I'm interested in, is thinking about the in-between spaces. Um, because, yeah, I think that people need some escapism sometimes. And sometimes, you know, sh sure, games can be, maybe games can be an outlet sometimes. Um, but there are plenty of studies that show that playing, uh, for example, like Red Dead Redemption, or I mean, the list of video games that Anita Sarkeesian has given us of where there's like, you have to kill and assault women to win the game. The list is huge, mm -hmm. right? So um, plenty of studies have shown that playing the games that have violence like that in them um, does actually cause people to have like a decrease in empathy and to treat other humans just like less or to treat women less. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I think the effects are real and it's not just escapism and it's not just fantasy. I've got a question down here. I don't know if you need. Yeah. Um, I can just speak loudly. Can she have? No, because it's recorded. I mean, Misha can hear her, but then people yeah. behind can't. Um, first, thank you so much for coming and for your presentation. Um, I have been fascinated by your Autonets project. I've read about it before your presentation, and I think it's it's really interesting how you use technology to create networks to provide safety for people who feel threatened by the authorities that are in charge of their area, right? And you talked about how some of the costs to producing those, those technologies um, offset the protection and how education-based um, you know, information provided to these groups could provide safety to them more. And I was curious what your opinion on, um, was on how and if this type of education or technology could be applied to countries like Chechnya or areas like Chechnya where um, you know, young individuals are persecuted and killed based on their Google searches identifying them as gay and how your type of art and technology could apply to those situations. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I am really in favor of uh, community-based design. And um, recently, so after I did Autonets and after I wrote my book, there's this uh, list of design justice principles, which I really like. And some of them I have been using for years, so I'm happy to see somebody wrote them down. Um, but if you look at designjusticenetwork.org, it has some of these principles like um, nothing, I mean, there's this old activist slogan or I think a disability rights slogan of like nothing about us without us. Mm -hmm. And that is like what I try to do in my work is um, when I'm designing for a particular community, um, I usually make an initial prototype. That's usually bad and ugly, and, but something I could put on the table and to show to people and then take it to a workshop and then show it to them and be like, what do you think? Is this good? Can you use it? and then immediately have my mind blown. So I would have no idea about Chechnya, but um, I would say to talk to some people from there. Um, and then, then there, you could come up with some solutions like that. Um, but I do think that, yeah, there's certainly like non-verbal non, non or non-technological safety strategies that people have been using for a long time that could be applied there. Um, I mean, like Home Alone, is it called Home Alone? Home Alive is this, uh, like, also feminist, queer and feminist uh, safety activist group in Seattle that has a website with some other strategies described there. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I think that it's important to talk to the affected community and get feedback from them, and not just talk to them. Like, if you go into that meeting being like, here's the precious object I worked on for six years. Is it right? <laughs> and then they're like, no, it sucks. Then you're like, okay, I'm not changing anything. <laughs> then that doesn't really work. So I like the open source methodology of release early, release often. Mm -hmm. So like, really, like as soon as you have a prototype that you could like show to somebody 
or if you have an idea about a project, like talk to somebody. Like when I made Unstoppable, I was like, hmm, maybe we can make our own bulletproof clothing. Well, Patrice was like, hey, I really like your mesh network clothing, let's collaborate. And I was like, oh my gosh, yes, let's collaborate. Um, and she had released this line of t-shirts and hoodies that said bulletproof across the front. And I'm really into DIY stuff, so um, I just thought, oh, maybe we could make DIY bulletproof stuff. But I also immediately thought like, oh, that could be a really bad idea. And so I don't know if that's a good idea. So I immediately like asked her and talked to other people in the community about should we pursue this project? Like as soon as I had the idea and I could just describe it in a sentence. And they were like, yeah, sounds, that sounds good. <laughs> um, free bulletproof clothing sounds good. So we went on and proceeded. Can you do one more question? Which gets back to the collaboration question. Yeah. Yep, we have one right here. Hi. Um, I was wondering what advice you have for women in um, a predominantly male field of technology and computer science um, for dealing with imposter syndrome and discrimination that they face. Thank you. Um, I mean, I think that imposter syndrome is real and intense and even just like school, universities and grad school are like, I think people really underestimate the psychological toll and challenge of these spaces and how hostile they can be and rarely might tell you about that, you know? Um, like there's a great article called The Shape of My Impact by Alexis Pauline Gums. It talks about this in detail. But um, I think that imposter syndrome is real and common. So I also think that fake it till you make it is very real. Um, I think it's kind of magic, actually. Like, I think Ricardo really encouraged me in the beginning to be like, you know, just say what you are until you're that thing. Mm. And I was like, really? Okay. Well, I'm an artist theorist. <laughs> <laughs> and then I just keep saying, I am an artist theorist until like people started to believe it. <laughs> and then they curated me into things and wanted to publish my stuff. And I was like, wow, okay. I guess I published some articles. I guess that makes me a theorist and an artist. Yeah, cool. So that, yeah, it was very real for me to be like, I'm gonna do this thing. Um, but also to know that uh, it's, not, it's not an accident that the field is male dominated. I mean, we live in a patriarchal society, obviously, from what's been happening in this country in the last few years or weeks, whatever. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like, it couldn't be more obvious now, I think, after Kavanaugh, yeah. uh, or more, it couldn't be, it's like undeniable. Um, and so it's not an accident, it's widespread, it's not just that field. And also, uh, something that's been really important for me is to like find specific inspirations and hold them close to my heart. So, like, um, like Gloria Anzaldúa was a, queer, disabled, Chicana, uh, poet, artist, philosopher, historian, and she put it all together in one book. And um, that just inspired me for like my whole career. And now I have like a picture of Gloria Anzaldúa in my living room, because I got to see her every day and be like, thinking about you, thank you for being with me. Because um, those people were there before you, like Ada Lovelace, a lot mm -hmm. of people would say wrote the first computer program and Grace Hopper wrote the first compiler. And there's so many women that came before us. I mean like hidden figures, like the whole word computer <laughs> used to just mean woman. So, um, you know, you're not the only one. There's a lot of people at your back. Well, thank you, Misha. This is usually when Chris says we'll be out there, right? Yeah, so, <laughs> Misha, do you have time if, if students have questions they want to ask? Yeah. Yeah, so we'll be out there, or okay. Misha will be out there. Thanks, everyone.